Hello everyone, I'm Gareth. Welcome along to Somewhere on Earth. It is Tuesday the 30th of July 2024. We're in London with voices from, uh, well, London, also Delhi, but the person was in London. Anyway, uh, you'll pick it up as you go along. Here we are. And with us today... In London, let's mention that again, is uh, Peter Guest, um, journalist and all-round good chap. Um, there we are. Right. So, uh, Pete, how are you? Okay? Yeah, not too bad. Go. How are you? Yeah, but all right. Thank you. And just trying to get my head around this whole business of the crowd strike incident, you know, that huge outage on July the 19th, when a lot of the infrastructure just switched off. Yep. Yeah. Why, why worry about cybersecurity when a cybersecurity company can just take down a chunk <laughs> of the internet in one go? Didn't go well. Um, but the, the kind of news ish peg for talking about it now is that um, Microsoft has just put out a little kind of report about what it's learned and what happened. So, in my best possible way of trying to explain this really briefly, what had happened was that this was an issue at so-called kernel level. So in other words, right at the very heart of the Windows operating system. And Pete, I'm very simplistic. And by the way, dear listener, if I'm talking rubbish here, do write in. But my way that I've made myself understand this is if you imagine an operating system as being like a really high secure building, it's a bit like kernel level is the control center right at the very heart of that building that controls everything, the air con, the lights, the doors, you name it, the one part of the building that you really can't have going wrong. And it was the Microsoft Windows equivalent of that where this issue was, which obviously gives an idea of how it became so serious. And the whole thing, of course, has raised questions about whether third-party organizations, in this case, the company CrowdStrike, should have access to such a fundamental part of such a ubiquitous operating system Microsoft has come up with a few interim lessons that they've learned, like, for instance, improving the safety of security updates. I could probably have told them that, to be honest, but there is a bit more detail there, to be fair to them. And it's just interesting to see this sort of interim conclusion from what was a pretty disastrous day for Microsoft and that uh, company, CrowdStrike. Um, but just briefly, Pete, you're a bit of a... You're an infrastructure fan, aren't you? Uh, I love a bit of infrastructure. How was it for you, darling? <laughs> I mean, to take your metaphor a little bit further, I mean, it's a high security building where it was kind of put together by volunteers. A couple of companies built the back door. Maybe the foundations were laid by some scientists in the 1970s. And, and that's the thing with the Internet, right? We've talked about this before, that it's sort of a public good that's run on this cobbled together infrastructure. Some of it's private, some of it's public, some of it's robust, some of it just falls off. Mm, as we saw <laughs> the other day on um, Friday, July the 19th. All right, let's jump in. And coming up today, Russian censorship and VPN providers. That's what we're talking about in the first half. Uh, Russia's been ordering browser developers to remove anti-censorship add-ons and also tech companies to remove certain VPNs from their app stores. But isn't complying just the reality of doing business in Russia? Or is it just putting profit before principle and giving in to state surveillance? Also today, how women can take back the internet from the trolls. It's all right here on the Somewhere on Earth podcast. So the Mozilla Foundation, best known for the Firefox browser, has been in the news. At the behest of Russia, it's temporarily removed browser add-ons that help people in Russia evade state censorship. One activist quoted in an article by the investigative journalism site The Intercept wasn't happy, calling this a rash decision from the Mozilla Foundation. But a few weeks later, the mighty LREG, yes, the Register Tech News website, said Mozilla had actually shown guts having removed reversed the ban, reinstating the browser add-ons that Russia didn't like. And that really is more than can be said for Apple. Now, it angered one VPN provider for complying with Russian demands for its tool to be taken down from Apple's Russian app store. So let's talk VPNs, Russian censorship and the tech companies with uh, none other than uh, Samuel Woodhams, who's a freelance researcher and is here in the studio. Hello, Samuel. Hi, Gareth. Thanks for having me. Always good to see you as well. Um, now, 
first of all, you can critique my summary of what went on. This is, I know there's quite a lot to unpack here. You know, VPNs were ordered to be taken down. Mozilla got itself into a little bit of hot water by complying with Russia, but then it seems to have gone back on it. There's quite a lot to unpack here. So for the confused listener, let's just start with the Mozilla Foundation. So the, the people behind Firefox. What happened then? What what did Russia or its agency anyway, this um, Roskom Nadzor agency within the Russian authority, what did it tell Mozilla Foundation to do? Yeah, so uh, Roskom Nadzor, uh, like you say, is Russia's kind of internet censorship agency. And uh, over the last at least kind of three or four years now, they've been going after VPN providers uh, to basically prevent people in Russia uh, from using these apps. Uh, primarily because of the kind of increased blocking uh, of online resources that Russia have been conducting over the last few years, and then particularly since the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine. Um, and what we've seen is really a, a kind of multi-pronged attack on VPNs from, from Russia, uh, one of which is going after browser developers like Mozilla and asking for certain add-ons, which are a bit like Chrome extensions, uh, to be removed. They've also been going over after... Um, uh, operating system developers, so Apple, to take down, I think the, the full number was 25 apps, um, 25 VPNs that uh, Apple complied with and removed from their app store. Uh, and all of this is having a, a pretty detrimental impact on people in Russia trying to access news uh, and lots of other information that is uh, currently being restricted. Yeah, because you mentioned Apple there, and there's a, a VPN on its app store, the Red Shield VPN, I think that was taken down, wasn't it? Yeah, so it seems in this kind of round of, of targeted attacks, they are looking at apps that are specifically designed to operate in Russia, uh, and particularly those that are being used uh, pretty widespreadly in the country. Um, but there's lots of other big names that have also been affected, and this really is only just one way that they are also being targeted. We saw um, earlier in the year Russia started actually disrupting the protocols that enable all VPNs to, to operate. Um, the problem with that is that uh, even what Russia would consider legitimate use uh, of VPN. So businesses using them for, for, for people working remotely, uh, they were disrupted too. Mm. And dear listeners, sorry for being a bit back to front here. Perhaps we should just explain, just in case people are wondering what VPNs are. I bet you, well, you, you're going to have like a media friendly definition if anyone does, Samuel. So what is a VPN? So in its simplest terms, uh, it reroutes your internet connection to a different server before going onto a website. And often that server can be in a different country, uh, essentially meaning that your internet traffic looks as if it's originating from a different country. Right. So if you're in Russia, where uh, the New York Times is banned, uh, you can access a server that is based in Germany, where it's not, and therefore access the New York Times. And that thing you were saying with protocols then, so these were the certain technical protocols on the internet that VPNs use in order to create that cloaking effect, if you like, to make it look as if you're in a different country to where you actually are. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're essentially the kind of under underlying rules uh, that enable essentially all of them to operate. And there's a number of different protocols, but it's what enables them to work. Yeah, all right. Um, so, Peter, what do you make of all this? Because I know just in your work in investigative journalism, you'll be using a lot of these kinds of tools. Um, you can tell me now how much you have or haven't operated in Russia. I know you've worked in a lot of former Soviet Union states, let's put it that way. Uh, so what do you make of all this? I mean, look, I think the first thing to say here is that I mean, you've just explained what a VPN is, and this can often feel really abstract. All of surveillance and censorship can feel really abstract. It's particularly those of us living in the West, right? But you have to give the context as to what happens in, in the dark, I guess you'd say. Um, Russia under Putin is a place where control of information is used as a weapon. So shutting off that information from the outside world by stopping people using a VPN, stopping them seeing the New York Times or any other media source is actually about creating a vacuum that you then fill yourself with your own narratives. And those narratives are pretty horrendous. You know, this is what allows you to create an environment where all of your opponents are traitors, they're terrorists, where you demonise foreigners, you demonise religious minorities, you demonise LGBTQI people, which is happening in Russia right now. And they're being exposed to violence as a result of it. So information control feels really abstract. 
but it actually has really very serious real world consequences. Yeah, I, I mean, that's what in a few minutes we're going to hear from a digital activist and academic in India who certainly knows all about that. You know, what happens when you bump up against the state, or certainly people who don't like you very much. You put a human aspect onto these stories, and you realise, yeah, that this is far from abstract for so many people. Um, and Samuel, what about the what happened with the Mozilla Foundation? Because I picked up on this story because I read this piece in the excellent um, Intercept uh, investigative news on the excellent Intercept um, investigative news website, and it was a headline really saying that this is the Mozilla Foundation kind of giving in to caving into Russian demands. And I was thinking, this isn't the Mozilla Foundation that I, that I've known for a long time. In fact, I use the Firefox browser, and I know that they really care about um, sort of digital rights online, for instance. So it does seem as if they went back on this then. So in the end, they reinstated these add-ons. But I mean, it's, uh, and they're not here to talk about this themselves. So I'm just being a little bit careful here. But what do you make of the Mozilla Foundation itself being drawn into this? Yeah, I think it's a it's a difficult one. Um, on on the one hand, you know, it's it's good that that these apps have been reinstated. These add-ons are, are now accessible again. Um, it's not ideal that they were taken down in the first place. But I think what it goes to show is the kind of the complex um, responsibilities that these sorts of companies have in, in countries like Russia. Um, they are at risk if they don't comply with a number of kind of legal and potentially kind of financial impacts. But ultimately, they had they also have an ethical duty to, to maintain these tools um, and to allow people in Russia to access this information. So it's a really difficult one, um, but obviously positive that they have been reinstated. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we did actually ask Mozilla Foundation for a comment. We haven't heard back from them, but uh, of course, they're not here to give their side of the story. But, um, you know, but I think you've made a very good point there, Samuel, about the fine line that they and so many other tech organisations have to tread here. Uh, maybe a final few words from you on this, Pete, if you have... Anything I mean, I'm not burning, sure I, I can say it much much better than Samuel did there. I think it's never going to be black and white, but you, you have to make a decision as as the company. You know, do you continue to offer the tools, mm. or do you and do you offer a bastardized form of your product? Because at least that way, you you, you know, you're offering those tools, or or does that make you complicit? And yeah. there's going to be different degrees of complicity. Yeah. I think. And are you doing more harm by just walking away rather than just complying a little bit or making it look as if you're complying? Yeah, it's complicated. And, you know, the thin end of the wedge argument is always a challenging one, but but where do you start complying? Where do you stop? Yeah, this is it. All right. Thank you very much, folks. Um, now, the starting point for women when it comes to dealing with trolls is solidarity. So says a well-known Indian journalist and academic, Dr. Sanjukta Basu, has been viciously trolled herself. A horrid experience, of course, and one that led Sanjukta to study online trolling in her PhD thesis. Um, she's been in the UK recently, taking part in a number of conferences, so it's been a great chance to catch up with Sanjukta in person. In fact, I first met her way back in 2006 when I was with the BBC interviewing the infamous Delhi bloggers and they were a group of suitably webby and very lovely people who were blogging right back in those really early days. So back to Sanjukta's research on trolls then and how women can fight back against toxicity online, especially in the face of some pretty nasty orchestrated stuff spewed out by right-wing nationalists in India. First, Sanjuksa and I talked about online safe spaces for women. Online safe spaces for women just means that they should have the the right to be able to express themselves, whether that is about a political expression or even their everyday existential quest on and, and this goes back to my own life my own experiences on the internet i started blogging in the year 2005 when blog was a very new thing in india and across the world and i realized that until that moment when i started blogging just as a fluke incident but that gave me a whole new turn of life it was like my second birth i, I believe that just like philosopher hannah aron says that human beings are born equal but are also with specific human Humanity, but th but that specific humanity is only acquired when we place ourselves into the public sphere with our words and our deeds, not out of some utility or need, but just as a voluntary action. And I believe that women traditionally have not been able to place themselves in the public sphere, either with their political views or their real life stories, lived experiences, because traditionally they've been told to live in the private sphere. But internet gives women that kind of a hybrid space 
series which is both public yet private it is both personalized yet detached here women can and as i have can actually express themselves and raise a political consciousness a feminist consciousness and a whole new outlook of their life that but that space so, 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 and that's the yeah. upside but as you've seen to your own cost really uh, that there's the trolling aspect as well yeah. making it very difficult yeah and and that's exactly where uh, my research comes in because i saw the initial phase of internet which gave me this empowering space but i also 2016 onwards started noticing and started facing trolling myself a lot as we saw a rise of hindu nationalist government in india a right wing hindu nationalist ethno religious party in india i started facing a trolling a lot and i then it occurred to me that the same space which was so empowering suddenly got very hostile suddenly got very threatened uh, it it seemed like i can no longer use my space for my political expression or even my day to day expressions so you know that turned unsafe and it all come then uh, my study my research revolves around this question it began with my own experiences but then i also uh, interviewed 15 indian women who have also faced trolling as i have the point of the of the study is to gather these experiences to gather these evidences how women have been using the space of the internet the public sphere of the, the digital public sphere of the twitter for their political expression and then how that gets attacked how that gets chipped away bit by bit actually by trolling harassment abusive hate speech lies you know those kinds of Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and we've seen so much of the online space become increasingly toxic across many platforms and of course Twitter's uh, X has had a va- bad rap for this. I wonder if the situation online in India has been amplified by the political events going on in India, you know, and the, the, the flourishing I suppose of Hindu nationalism that we've seen over the last decade or so. Yeah yeah I- Indian online space is very much influenced by the rise of the right wing nationalist party. because they have the first players advantage on the internet amongst all the political parties in india the bharatiya janata party and its ideological parent the, the rss rashtriya swayamsevak sangh they are the first movers on internet they started using internet way back in the 90s because they felt that the traditional media the legacy media did not give them enough ample uh, space to represent their voices which i would say in my opinion a rightly uh, gatekept because legacy media gatekeeps certain kind of hateful narratives you know like anti muslim narratives or anti immigrants narratives um, hate speech so you couldn't publish them on the television or the newspapers you know traditionally but internet then became a space for these right wing hindu nationalist counter public to use this space to run with their agendas and their propagandas so therefore now today we have the largest army of right wing nationalist trolls on in, on the internet and when i say trolls i don't mean it to be a derogatory word i mean to say that there is there are accounts which are right wing pro bjp pro rss or hindu nationalist account but it's very difficult to know whether they are real accounts or they are bots uh, uh, is one person running many accounts or are these really so many accounts so right, yeah, yeah. But, but what we do know is it's making it a very unpleasant and indeed unsafe online space for women uh, so gosh i mean this is very deep research that you're doing probably no easy answers but are you finding your way through to some kind of solutions maybe safe spaces for women online if that kind of thing is possible Stay with us. We'll be right back. Did you know that 95% of digital products fail within their first year of launch? Discover what makes the other 5% succeed. Brought to you by the leading digital product agency Infinum, Delivered is your window into innovative business solutions powered by technology. Each month, we interview business leaders and innovators behind successful digital products to unbox their success strategies. You can find Delivered wherever you get your podcasts.
there is no answer i my research sort of documents this arc of internet being a very empowering positive space to getting becoming hostile due to the rise of nationalism and hate speech and fake news post truth the post truth world that we now live in where we have actually lost morality standards ethics um, which is why women are constantly targeted and having documented having collected evidence from other my research participants how they are losing that space what does it mean to uh, hold on to that space on on twitter i have reached at a point where i know that yes we are losing that space but how do we reclaim that space how do we make the space safer there's no easy answer to it but i think just like in the physical space also women have always traditionally faced it find it difficult to go out in the street or in the park and if they get into trouble they would be asked oh what why was she in the park at late at night why was she wearing that kind of dress so similarly on the internet also we are now asked why do you go to twitter and make your political opinions but the only way we both in the public in the digital public sphere as well as the physical public sphere the only way we make it safer is by reclaiming it so not give up our fight and what i see really is that there is a there is a fight we see that there is a constant clash between the trolls and it's not just the trolls i have also been targeted by the mainstream media i have been targeted by the government uh, and not just me but a group of us we are not just dealing with the trolls but we're dealing with a whole systemic authoritative uh, regime which wants to impose one kind of ideology and whoever diverts from that ideology are being you know trolled and harassed in various ways but the only way we make it safer is by holding on to it one of the thing that i found out in my study is that when we stand up for each other that's what really empowers us and make us feel safer and also the trolls also get very baffled when they suppose one of them is coming to my timeline and abusing me but another woman then comes to my timeline and stands up against this troll that's when the trolls also gets very baffled like they don't know what to do with this and i as someone who was the victim of this abuse also feel this empowerment that you know somebody stood up for me and over and i spoke to all of my research participants they all said that yes the best way to deal with this is not not by blocking not by muting not by calling the cops or uh, tagging it to twitter but the best way is when we are standing up for each other and showing solidarity and yet i would put a disclaimer over here yet it is difficult to get there because we also have our internal differences political differences we have our inter, you know various kinds of um, mental space to deal with these trolls is it possible for us to go to somebody's timeline and then fight with the trolls to show solidarity it's not easy it's not difficult there we have a sense of competitive victimhood that that breeds in us so it's all very messy <laughs> It certainly is. Uh, that's Sanjukta Bassi t- speaking to me a few days ago in London. And, um, well, the, the three guys sitting here in the studio, far be it for us to want to sit here and mansplain online safety to women. So we're not even going to go there, obviously. But, uh, uh, Pete Guest, what did you make of what you just heard? Well, I mean, we should address the point there's three guys sitting in a room. Because, I mean, historically, I think that is the composition of or the demographic of the people who made policy at social media platforms, right? And there's a there's a very credible argument that the lack of representation within tech companies is what's led us to a place where this kind of thing is is systemic. And and it is, it's structural, right? We've been talking about this for, you know, eight nearly 20 years. It's structural, right? We know the algorithms that govern what is surfaced on platforms are engineered to maximize engagement what maximizes engagement is amplifying division and anger and with that comes hate speech and and dehumanization and i think you know it's very encouraging to see you know the the idea of solidarity as a mechanism against this but there is another mechanism against this just fix the algorithms yes that would be nice wouldn't it yeah and fix those algorithms by having more diverse people in the room when those algorithms are being fixed right and i think you know we just talked about censorship right and i'm aware that there is this very reductive argument that runs well you deprioritize people to expand these ideologies and that's a form of censorship but the information space is just so toxic and it's been so poisoned that you know this isn't a public square it's a hostile
small space where one party's been given a bullhorn. Yeah, it, and it was kind of almost heartbreaking, really, what it, what it was to hear Sanjuk to saying that women have to reclaim the online space again. I mean, it's crazy for any group of people, or indeed any individual, to feel that they're not welcome. And the idea that, you know, even if there was a, a way, if, if Sanjuk said, right, this is the way that we can reclaim the space, even to be having that conversation that I found, find and did find during that interview, profoundly depressing. After all, look, you know, where we're meant to be, you know, mid, well, you know, 2024. Um, Samuel Woodhams, I know you've come on here to talk about other things, but um, you were listening to that and I could see you were very engaged with what Sanjukta was saying. Yeah, I think it's a really powerful message, actually. Um, and it's obviously such a significant issue globally. Um, obviously, here in the UK, there's been a lot of discussion around the online safety bill, trying to in- tackle these exact kind of problems. Um, and I also think the the kind of issue around anonymity is a is a really difficult and an important one because on the one hand anonymity online has has enabled toxicity for sure, um, but it can also provide a kind of a safety net for people that otherwise may be persecuted in the real world. And I think finding the balance around anonymity online and making sure that there is responsibly used and the platforms are able to protect their users is is really really significant. No, sure. And and I suppose my own two penneth, listening to that and during the interview and, you know, Sanjukta was talking about how some people might say, well, you know, for women, it's it's very easy or, you know, for any group that gets a hard time online, if you don't want to be trolled, well, the best thing to do is not be there in the first place or just switch off your comments, which is a ridiculous thing to say to any human being in, in the first place. Um, but it's it's a bit like these people who sort of say to women, well, you know, the best thing to do is when you're out late, late at night, if you, you know, do that thing where you've got your key between your, you know, two knuckles, for instance, just in case anything happens and make sure you stay in lit areas. No, it's like, hang on, men, do you mind just not making women feel like that in the first place? You know, that would be quite nice. And uh, the uh, online equivalence applies. So, so there we are. Um, I think we can leave it there. But thank you very much indeed to you, Pete Guest. You're back again next week. Thanks for going. Ooh, see yes. you then. Always nice to see you as well, Samuel. And, um, more, of course, from uh, both these guys in the subscription version of this podcast. And yeah, look, I get it, folks. If you don't subscribe, I know it's annoying to have that FOMO of, oh, they, you know, that's all for the subscription. It's not on. But somehow we need to keep the lights on around here. So <laughs> the subscription it is. So I'm just going to give that a little plug, if you don't mind, just really quickly. It's uh, 10 US dollars a month. And if you don't like it, you can cancel that subscription anytime. Uh, of course, we'd rather you didn't. Uh, but we know you're paying for it. So we make it good and we try and get good content from our guests and give you that value uh, for 10 extra US dollars a month. So you're getting two hits really. I suppose you get that extra somewhere on earth goodness and the other hit is just knowing you're doing a good thing. You're supporting a podcast that we humbly would like to put it to you. Comes on every week and talks about the kind of important issues we've heard from today and not all podcasts do that and uh, we think a lot of these stories of course are very important and they are often stories that I think of as being the unloved ones that don't get the really big headlines on the main tech news outlets and so on. And we come in here and do them. And I hope we do them justice. Maybe we're not doing them justice, which brings me to the second part of what I want to say here. If you feel that we could be doing better or you have other stuff to add, then of course you can get in touch. That's how it goes. I mean, we're talking about blogging being invented in the early 2000s and back in 2006 for those Delhi bloggers. So you know the score by now. This is a participatory space. Um, So we're on pretty much all the main platforms that you might expect. So if you search for things like Somewhere on Earth or um, Soap Tech, S-O-E-P Tech, we're pretty easy to find. And of course, we have our very active Facebook group and lots of other ways. So I know I'm waffling on a bit, but I think occasionally it's just good to give this a bit of a push and remind you that um, we are very interested in you being part of this podcast as well. Um, Otherwise, it's just a bloke like me talking to himself for two minutes at you. So... (laughs) The other thing to say, our email is hello at somewhereonearth.co and on WhatsApp we're code 44-7486-329-484. And I played back uh, the podcast from the other day and realised I said that very quickly and you might not have had a chance to note it. So it's code 44-7486-329-484. 
0484. There you go, that's all the plugs over. Phew, what a relief. Um, audio this week has been by Kazaya Wenham Kenyon here at Lanson's Team Fauna. Um, the production manager is Liz Tui. The editor and producer is Annie Liktorovich. And I'm Gareth. Thanks for listening. Bye bye. Mm-hmm.